The Urge, an O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Story of 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Urge by Marilyn Allen She is now a woman ageless because she is famous. She's surrounded by a swarm of lovers and possesses a great many beautiful things. She has more than one Ming jar in the library at her country place, yards upon yards of Point de Venise in her top bureau drawer. She is able to employ a very pleasant, wholesome woman, whose sole duty it is to keep her clothes in order. She wears superb clothes, the last word in richness and the elegance of perfection, clothes that no man can declaim over, stimulating himself the while with shot after shot of that most insidious of all dope, self-pity. You see, she earns them all herself, along with the Ming jars, the Point de Venise, the country place, and countless other things. She is the funniest woman in the world, not in her press agent's imagination, but in cold, sober fact. She can make anybody laugh. She does make everybody. Night after night in the huge public theatres of the common people, in the small private ones of the commoner rich, in Greek amphitheatres where the laughter rolls away in thunderous waves to be echoed back by distant blue hills, in institutions for the blind, in convalescent wards, everywhere, every time, she makes them laugh. The day laborer, sodden and desperate from too much class legislation, the ego in his cosmos and the struggle for existence, the statesman fearful of losing votes, rendered blue and depressed by the unruliness of nations and all the vast multitude of horrors that lie in between, all of these, all of them, she makes laugh. She is queen of the profession she has chosen, unusual for one of her sex. She is the funniest woman in the world. When she is at home, which is seldom, she has many visitors, and strives, if possible, to see none of them. You know, I entertain so much, she pleads, in that vivid, whimsical way of hers that holds as much of sadness as mirth. But this time, it being so early in the afternoon, she was caught unawares. The girls, they were nothing but girls, three of them, sitting on a seat where the velvety green turf fell away in a steep hillside, and far beneath them they could see the river moving whitely beyond the trees. They halted there before her, happy but trembling, giggling but grave. They were gasping and incoherent, full of apologies and absurd tremors. It had taken their combined weak savings to bribe the gardener, and they only wanted to know one thing. How had she achieved all this fame and splendor? By what magic process had she become that rarest of all living creatures, the funniest woman in the world? It was an easy enough question to ask, and to them, hovering, twittering upon high heels a trifle worn to one side, a simple one for her to answer. She looked at them in that humorous, kindly way of hers, looked at their silly, excited, made-up faces, with noses sticking out stark like handles from a too heavy application of purplish-white powder. Then her glance traveled down the velvety green slope to the bright river glancing and leaping beyond the shady trees. Did she think of that other girl, sitting there with that strange smile upon her face, the smile that is neither mirth nor sadness, but a poignant, haunting compound of both? Did she remember her and the urge that had always been upon her, racking her like actual pain, driving her with a whip of scorpions, flaying her on and on with a far more vivid sense of suffering than the actual beatings laid on by her mother's heavy hand, the thing that found articulation in the words, 
I must be famous, I must. She belonged in the rear of a batch of a dozen, and had never been properly named. The wind was blowing from the stockyards on the dark hour when she arrived. It penetrated even to the small, airless chamber where she struggled for her first breath, one of a flat in the poorest tenement in the worst slum in Chicago. Huddled in smelly rags by a hastily summoned neighbor from the floor above, the newcomer raised her untried voice in a frail, reedy cry. Perhaps she did not like the smell that oozed in around the tightly closed window to combat the foul odors of the airless room. Whatever it was, this protest availed her nothing, for the neighbor hurriedly departed, having been unwilling from the first, and the mother turned away and lay close against the stained, discolored wall, too apathetic, too utterly resigned to the fate life had meted out to her, to accord this most unwelcome baby further attention. This first moment of her life might easily serve as the history of her babyhood. Her father was also indifferent. He brought home his money and gave it to his wife. Children were strictly none of his business. Her brothers and sisters, each one busily and fiercely fending for himself, gave no attention to her small affairs. Tossed by the careless hand of fate into the dark sea of life to swim or perish, she awoke to consciousness with but one thought, food, one ruling passion, to get enough. And since in her habitual half-starved state, all food looked superlatively good to her, cake was the first word she learned to speak. It formed her whole vocabulary for a surprisingly long time, and cake was the only name she was ever known by in her family circle, and on the street that to her ran on and on and on, as narrow and dirty, as crowded and as cruel as where it passed the great dilapidated old rookery that held the four dark rooms that she called home. Up to the age of ten her life was sketchy, a passionate scramble for food, beatings, tears, slumber, a swift transition from one childish ailment to another that kept her forever out of reach of the truant officer. She lay upon the floor in a little dark room, and through the window in the airless air shaft, high up in one corner, she could see a three-cornered spot of light. At first she wondered what it was, since she lived in a tenement not under the sky. Then it resolved itself into a ball, white and luminous, that floated remote in that high place and seemed to draw her, and was somehow akin to the queer, gnawing pain that developed about that time beneath her breastbone. It was all inarticulate, queer and confused. She did not think, she did not know how. She only felt that queer gnawing pain beneath her breastbone, distinct from all her other pains, and which she ascribed to hunger, and saw the lovely trembling globe of light. At first she felt it only when she was ill, and lay on the tumbled floor bed and looked up through the dark window, afterward always in her dreams. After she passed her tenth birthday, the confusion within her seemed to settle as the queer pain increased, and she began to think, to wonder what it could be. A year or two later her father died, and as she was the only child over whom her mother could exercise any control, the report of her death was successfully impressed upon the truant officer, so that she might be put to work unhindered to help the family in its desperate scramble for food, a scramble in which she took part with vivid earnestness. She was hired to Mavericks to wash dishes. Maverick was a Greek, and kept an open all-night chop-house, a mean hole in the wall two doors from the corner, where Cake's surpassing thinness made her invaluable at the sink. Also the scrap she carried home in her red, water-puckered hands helped out materially. Then her mother took a boarder, and rested in her endeavors, feeling she had performed all things well.' 
This man was a boarder with a past, and he had left it pretty far behind, else he had never rented a room and meals from the mother of cake. In this border, drink and debauchery had completely beaten out of shape what had once been a very noble figure of a man. His body was shrunken and trembling. The old ragged clothes he wore flapped about him like the vestments of a scarecrow. His cheeks had the bruised, congested look of the habitual drinker. His nose seemed a toadstool on his face. and his red eyes were almost vanished behind puffy, purple, pillow-like lids. His voice was husky and whispering except when he raised it. Then it was surprisingly resonant and mellow, with something haunting in it like the echo of an echo of a very moving sweetness. One night Cake, returning all weary and played out from dishwashing at Maverick's, heard him speaking in this loud voice of his, pushed the door open a crack, and peeked in. He was standing in the middle of the floor, evidently speaking what the child called to herself a piece. Her big mouth crooked derisively in the beginning of what is now her famous smile. The lodger went on speaking, being fairly well stimulated at the time, and presently Cake pushed the door wider and crept into the dry goods box, where her mother always kept a candle, and sat down. The lodger talked on and on while Cake sat wrapped, the flickering candle in her hands throwing strange lights and shadows upon her gaunt face. How was she to know she was the last audience of one of the greatest Shakespearean actors the world had ever seen? It was a grave and wondering cake that crept to her place to sleep that night between her two older sisters, and while they ramped against her and chewed and snorted in her ears, she listened all over again to that wonderful voice and was awed by the color and beauty of the words that it had spoken. She slept and saw before her the globe of light, trembling and luminous, the one bright thing of beauty her life had ever known, that seemed to draw her up from darkness slowly and with great suffering. Trembling and weeping, she awoke in the dawn, and the strange pain that had tortured her so much and that she had called hunger and sought to assuage with scraps from the plates that came to the sink at Maverick's became articulate at last. With her hands clasped hard against her breast, she found relief in words. I gotta be somebody, sobbed the child. I must be famous. I must. She arose to find life no longer a confused struggle for food, but a battle and a march, a battle to get through one day to march on to the next, and so on and on until, in that long line of days that stretched out ahead of her, like chambers waiting to be visited, she reached the one where rested fame, that trembling, luminous globe of beauty it was so vitally necessary for her to achieve. How come he can talk like that? she demanded of herself, musing on the lodger's wonderful exhibition over the greasy dishwater at Maverick's. And that night she asked him, prefacing her question with the offering of an almost perfect lamb chop. Only one piece had been cut from it since the purchaser, at that moment apprised by Maverick himself that the arrival of the police was imminent, had taken a hasty departure. Who learned you to talk that away? demanded Cake, licking a faint, far away flavor of the chop from her long, thin fingers. The lodger, for a moment, had changed places with the candle. That is to say, he sat upon the dry goods box, the candle burned upon the floor. And having been most unfortunate that day, the lodger was tragically sober. He bit into the chop voraciously, like a dog with his broken, discolored teeth. A book learned me, he said, and practice and experience, and something else. He broke off short. They called it genius then, he said bitterly.
Cake took a short step forward. That thing beneath her prominent breastbone pained her violently, forced her on to speak. "'You learn me,' she said. The lodger ceased to chew and stared, the chop-bone uplifted in his dirty hand. A pupil for him. "'You want to do this, perhaps,' he began. "'Pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man.' The disreputable, swollen-faced lodger with a nose like a poison toadstool vanished. Cake saw an old, white-haired man, crazy and pitiful, yet bearing himself grandly. She gasped. The tears flew to her eyes, blinding her. The lodger laughed disagreeably. He was gnawing on the chop-bone again. "'I suppose you think because you found me here it is likely I'll teach you. "'You, you starved alley-cat,' he snarled. "'Cake did not even blink. "'It is repetition that dulls, and she was utterly familiar with abuse. "'And suppose I did learn you,' he sneered. "'What would you do with it?' "'I would be famous,' cried Cake. "'Then the lodger did laugh looking at her with his head hanging down, his swollen face all creased and purple, his hair sticking up rough and unkempt. He laughed, sitting there a degraded, debauched ruin, looking down from the height of his memories upon the gaunt, unlovely child of the slums, who was rendered even more unlovely by the very courage that kept her waiting beside the broken door. "'So you think I could learn you to be famous, eh?' Even the words of this gutter-filth he sought to constitute into something nattering to himself. Cake nodded. Really, she had not thought of it that way at all. There was no thinking connected with her decision. The dumb hours she had spent staring up at the air-shaft had resolved themselves with the passing years in a strange, numb will to do. There was the light, and she must reach it. Indeed, the thing there behind the narrow walls of her chest gave her no alternative. She did not think she wanted to be an actress. It was a long time after that before she knew even what an actress was. She did not know what the lodger had been. No, instinctively, groping and inarticulate, she recognized in him the rags and shreds of greatness, knew him to be a one-time dweller in that temple, whither, willing or not, she was bound, to reach it or to die. The lodger looked down at the naked chop-bone in his hand. The juicy broiled meat was comforting to his outraged stomach. Meat! The word stood out in his mind to be instantly followed by that other word that, for him, had spelled ruin, made him a ragged panhandler, reduced him to living among the poorest and most hopeless. Drink. He raised his head and eyed Cake with crafty calculation. What will you pay me for such teaching, he demanded, and looked down again at the bone. What he did in the end, Cake herself was satisfied, came to him afterward. At first he was actuated only by the desire to procure food and drink, more especially the drink, at the cost of the least possible effort to himself. Cake saw the look, and she knew. She even smiled a little in the greatness of her relief. She saw she had been right to bring the chop and appreciated that her progress along the road to fame would be as slow or fast as she could procure food for him in lesser or greater quantities. "'I'll bring you eats,' she said cunningly. "'From Mavericks,' she added, by which she meant the eats would be has-is, distinctly second class, quite possibly third. The lodger nodded. "'And booze,' he put in, watching her face." and booze cake assented so the bargain was struck in a way that worked the most cruel hardship on the girl food she could steal and did blithely enough since she had no monitor but the lure of brightness and that thing within her breast that hotly justified the theft and only urged her on but booze was a very different proposition it was impossible to steal booze even a little 
To secure booze, she was forced to offer money. Now what money Cake earned at Mavericks her mother snatched from her hand before she was well within the door. If she held out even a dime, she got a beating. And Cake's mother, in the later years of her life, besides being a clever evader of the police and the truant officer, developed into a beater of parts. Broken food the child offered in abundance and piteous hope, but the lodger was brutally indifferent. Food, he scoffed. Why, it says in the Bible, you never heard of the Bible, hey? Cake shook her tangled head. No, well, it's quite a book, commented the lodger. He had been fortunate that day, and was, for him, fairly intoxicated. And it says right in there, and some consider that book an authority, man cannot live by food alone. Drink. I drink when I have occasion, and sometimes when I have no occasion. Don't you know what drink is, Alley Cat? Very well, then. Wine is wont to show the mind of man, and you won't see mine until you bring me booze. Get out. And Kate got out. Also, being well versed in a very horrid wisdom, she took the food with her. This was hardly what the lodger had expected, and I think what respect he was capable of sprouted for her then. Behind a screen of barrels in the corner of the alley, Cake ate the broken meats herself, taking what comfort she could and pondering the while the awful problem of securing the booze, since she must be taught, and since the lodger moved in her sphere as the only available teacher. There was a rush up the alley past her hiding place, a shout, and the savage thud of blows. Very cautiously, as became one wise in the ways of life in that place, Cake peered around a barrel. She saw Red Dan, who sold papers in front of Jeer Dooley's place, thoroughly punishing another and much larger boy. The bigger boy was crying. "'Anybody can sell Piper,' shouted Red Dan, pounding the information home bloodily. "'You hear me? Anybody!' Kate crept out of her hiding place on the opposite side. She did not care what happened to the bigger boy, though she respected Red Dan the more. She knew where the money was going to come from to buy the lodger's booze. It meant longer hours for her. It meant care to work only out of school hours. It meant harder knocks than even she had experienced. It meant a fatigue there were no words to describe, even among the beautiful, wonderful, colorful ones the lodger taught her. But she sold the papers, and she purchased the booze. Her mother did not know where she spent this extra time. She did not care, since the money came in from Maverick steadily each week. Neither did the lodger care how the booze was procured. The big thing to him was that it came. At first these lessons were fun for him, the big, gawky, half-starved, overworked child seeing so vividly in pictures all that he told her in words. Full fed on the scraps from Mavericks, he was no longer fastidious, well stimulated by the drink she brought, he took an ugly sort of degraded pleasure in posturing before her, acting as he alone could act, those most wonderful of all plays, watching with hateful sardonic amusement the light and shadow of emotion upon her dirty face. Oh, he was a magician, no doubt at all of that, past master in the rare art of a true genius, that of producing illusion. Then he would make Cake try, rave at her, curse her, strike her, kill himself laughing, drink some more, and put her at it again. Night after night, almost comatose from the fatigue of a day that began while it was still dark, she carried a heaped-up plate and a full bottle to the lodger's room, and sat down upon the dry-goods box with the candle beside her on the floor. And, having thus secured her welcome, night after night she walked with him among that greatest of all throngs of soldiers and lovers, kings and cardinals, 
queens, prostitutes, and thieves. If the liquor was short in the bottle a dime's worth, the lesson was curtailed. At first Cake tried to coax him. Ah, come on, you Romeo on the street in Mantua! But the lodger was never so drunk that he made the slightest concession. Yes, I'm Romeo, all right. The lads there never fear gutter snipe. But the bottle is not full. After that she never attempted to change his ruling. She was letter-perfect in the bitter lesson, and if the sale of papers did not bring in enough to fill the bottle, she accepted the hard fact with the calm of great determination, and did not go near the lodger's room, but went to bed instead. Perhaps it was these rare occasions of rest that kept her alive. After the lodger had been teaching her for several years, her mother died and was buried in the potter's field. Cake managed to keep two rooms of the wretched flat, and no word of his landlady's demise reached the lodger's drink-dulled ears. Otherwise Cake feared he might depart, taking with him her one big chance to reach the light. You see, she did not know the lodger. Things might have been different if she had, but he was never a human being to her, even after she knew the truth, only a symbol, a means to the greater end. Her brothers went away, to the penitentiary and other places. One by one the flood of life caught her sisters and swept them out, she did not know to what. She never even wondered. She had not been taught to care. She had never been taught anything. The knowledge that she must be famous danced through her dreams like a will-o'-the-wisp, had grown within her in the shape of a great pain that never ceased, only eased a little as she strove mightily toward the goal. So she still sold papers, a homely, gawky, long-legged girl in ragged clothes much too small for her, and slaved at Mavericks for the lodger's nightly dole that he might teach her and she be famous. At first he was keen on the meat and drink, and especially the drink. Later, gradually, a change came over him. Only Cake did not notice this change. She was too set on being taught so she could become famous. At first the lodger was all oaths and blows with shouts of fierce, derisive laughter intermingled. My God, he would cry, if Noise could only see this, if only he could. This Noise, it appears, was a man he furiously despised. When he was in the third stage of drunkenness he would never teach Cake, but would only abuse his enemies and this noise invariably came in for a fearful shower of epithets. It was he, as Cake heard it, sitting huddled on the old dry-goods box, the candle casting strange shadows into her gaunt, unchildlike face, who was the cause of the lodger's downfall. But for noise, with a blasting array of curses before the name, he would now have what Cake so ardently strove for— fame. But for noise he would be acting in his own theatre, riding in his own limousine, wearing his own diamonds, entertaining his own friends upon his own gold plate. When he was still too sober to take a really vital interest in the teaching, he was a misanthrope, bitter and brutal, with an astonishing command of the most terrible words. At these times he made the gravest charges against Noise, charges for which the man should be made accountable, even to such a one as the lodger. One evening Cake sat watching him, waiting for this mood to pass so that the teaching might begin. "'If I was used,' she said at last, "'and hated a guy like you's do this Noise, "'I'd fetch him a insult that'd get under his skin right.' I'd make evens wid him, I would, not just talk about it. Oh, you would, remarked the lodger. He took a long pull at the bottle. You would be Queen Catherine, you alley-cat. So the nightly teaching began with the usual accompaniment of curses, blows, and shouts of brutal laughter. Laughter. 
but when it was over and the lodger was sinking to the third stage that came inevitably with the bottom of the bottle, he kept looking at his pupil queerly. Oh, you would, would you? He said it over and over again. Oh, you would, would you? And after that he was changed by the leaven of hate her suggestion had started working in him. For one thing he took a far greater interest in the teaching for its own sake. Of that much the girl herself was thankfully aware. And she thought, Cake did, that the dull husk of self was wearing away from that part of her destined to be famous, wearing away at last. The lodger's curses changed in tone as the nights filed past. The blows diminished. The laughter became far more frequent. Cake, as rapidly reaching the end of her girlhood as the lodger was nearing the limits of his drink-sapped strength, redoubled her efforts. It was very plain to her that he could not live much longer. Death in delirium tremens was inevitable. After that, she decided, school would not keep, and she must try her fortune. Then one night in the midst of the potion scene, when she felt herself Juliet, soft, passionate, and beautiful, far away in the land of tragic romance, she heard the lodger crying, Stop! My God, stop! How do you get that way? Don't you know there's a limit to human endurance, Alley Cat? He was fairly toppling from the dry-goods box. His eyes were popping from his head, and in the flickering candlelight his face looked strained and queer. In afterlife she became very familiar with that expression. She saw it on all types of faces. In fact, she came to expect to see it there. But she did not know how to analyze it then. She glimpsed it only as a tribute to her performance, so immense that she had to be halted in the middle and felt correspondingly elated. She was exactly right in her deduction, but Cake and the lodger advanced along very different lines of thought. The next night he was shaky, came all too quickly to the teaching period, and left it as speedily. Then he retired to the flock mattress in the corner of the room and called Cake to bring the candle. "'I've an idea I'm going to leave you, Guttersnipe,' he said, "'and I doubt if I ever see you again. "'The end of life cancels all bands, "'and the one that bound you to me, Alley Cat, "'was very material, very material indeed, "'the kind that runs easily in and out of a black bottle.' "'He laughed.' "'You Shakespearean actress!' "'He laughed again, longer this time. "'But I have not forgotten you,' he resumed. "'In addition to all that I have taught you, "'I am going to leave you something. "'Here.' "'He fumbled out a square envelope, "'and Cake took it between her hands. "'Take that to the address written on it,' said the lodger, "'and see what the gentleman does.' "'He began to laugh again. "'Noise!' he cried, and broke off to curse feebly but volubly. Cake did not even glance in his direction. She went away out of the room, too utterly stunned with fatigue to look at the letter in her dingy hand. The next morning the lodger was dead. He was buried in the potter's field, quite near his old landlady. This second funeral, such as it was, closed the shelter that Cake, for want of a more fitting name, had called home. She decided to put all her years of bitterly acquired learning to the test, and as she best knew what she had bought and paid for it, she felt she could not fail. She unfolded from a scrap of newspaper the envelope presented her by the lodger, and carefully studied the address. Kate could both read and write, having acquired these arts from a waiter at Maverick's, who also helped her steal the broken meats with which she secured her artistic education. And watching the steady disappearance of the food, this waiter marveled that she got no fatter as she grew upward, hovering about in hope of becoming her lover if ever she did. But even if that miracle had ever been accomplished, the helpful waiter would still have waited. 
Cake's conception of a real lady was Queen Catherine, Cleopatra her dream of a dangerous, fascinating one, and what chance in the world for either with a waiter? Cake read the name and address upon the envelope freely as the hopeful breadcaster had taught her. Arthur Payson Noyes, National Theatre. With the simplicity and dispatch that characterized her, she went to that place. To the man reposing somnolently in the broken old chair beside the door, she said she had a letter for Mr. Noyes. The doorkeeper saw it was a large, swanking envelope with very polite writing. He straightened up in the chair long enough to pass her in, and then slumped down again. Cake found herself in a queer, barn-like old place, half room and half hallway, feebly illumined by a single electric bulb suspended above the door. Very composedly she looked about her. If Mr. Arthur Noyes lived in this place, he was one of her own kind, and there was no need for any palpitation on her part. Anyway, she was looking solely for her chance to become famous, and she brought to this second stage of her search the same indifference to externals, the same calm, unfaltering courage as she had to the first. "'Now then,' said a voice briskly, "'say what you want. We've not advertised for any extra people, at least not this year.' A short, stout man emerged from the shadows. He was very blond, with his hair cut snapper, and his pale eyes popped perpetual astonishment. She returned his look steadily and well. She knew she was born to be famous, and fame has a certain beauty of dignity utterly lacking in mere success. "'I am not an extra person,' she replied. "'I have come to see Mr. Noyes,' and she displayed once more the large square envelope, her legacy from the lodger, the knife with which she proposed to shuck from its rough shell that oyster, the world." The man looked even more astonished, if the thing could have been accomplished, and regarded her keenly, stared. "'Come this way,' he said. Cake followed him along a narrow passage that turned off to the right, down five steps, across a narrow entry, up three more steps, although it seems quite silly, she never in her life forgot the odd number of those worn steps, and halted before a closed door. On this the fat man knocked once, and opened immediately without waiting. "'Someone I think you'll see,' he said, standing between Cake and the interior. There came to her a murmur over his chunky shoulder. "'She has a letter from—' The fat man dropped his voice and mumbled. "'Positive,' he said aloud, after a pause, broken only by the vague murmur within the room. "'I'd know his fist anywhere. Yes.' Then he pushed the door open wide, stood aside, and looked at Cake. "'Walk in,' he said. She did so, beautifully. Poems have been written about her walk. Two kinds. The room she entered was square, with concrete floor and rough walls, but Cake did not notice the room for three reasons. The rug on the floor, four pictures on the walls, and the man who looked at her as she entered. They gazed at each other, Cake and this man, with sudden, intense concentration. He was a genius in his line, she as surely one in hers, and instinctively to that strange, bright flame each rendered instant homage. What he saw he described long afterward when a million voices were vociferously raised in a million different descriptions, what she saw she likened in her mind to a dark sheath from which a sword flashed gloriously. That sword was his soul. He says your name is Plain Cake, is that true? He referred to the lodger's letter held open in his hand, and by that she knew he was Arthur Noyes. And great! That last she had not needed any telling. Yes, she replied. He says here, he says you are the right Shakespearean actress for me, Noyes referred to the letter again. Do you know Shakespeare? 
"'All the way,' said Cake. "'It was not quite the answer Queen Catherine might have made, perhaps, "'but her manner was perfect. "'Come here,' he pointed to the center of the rapturous rug, "'and do the potion scene for me.' "'Cake stepped forward. "'Perhaps you have been so fortunate as to see her. "'If so, you know that to step forward is her only preparation. "'She was poised. She was gone.' Then suddenly she heard the lodger's voice crying, "'Stop! My God, stop! How do you get that way? Don't you know there's a limit to human endurance, Alley Cat?' She broke off, staring confusedly into space, just the height of his debauched old figure crouching on the dry-goods box. Then, with swift realization of her surroundings, her vision cleared, It was the fat man in the checked suit she saw leaning helplessly against the closed door. His jaw sagged, his eyes were frightfully popped, his face wore the same strained, queer look she had come to see so often on the lodgers, and he made weak little flapping gestures with his hands. Cake looked then at Arthur Noyes. His face was white as the letter in his hand. His dark eyes were dilated with a look of dreadful suffering, the numb, unconscious reaction of one who has received a mortal blow. "'Come here, Crumb,' he cried, as if there was no one else in the room, and Crumb fairly tottered forward. "'What do you make of this?' asked Noyes, while Cake stood and listened. "'I... I... "'stammered Crumb exhaustedly. "'My God, he groaned, it's too much for me. "'And training!' "'Oh, trained,' Cake heard Noyes say. "'Such training as only he could give. "'Years of it, that's plain. "'And then to send her to me, "'a Shakespearean actress for me, "'to insult me like that. "'It's too much for me, boss,' said Crumb again. "'Still, oh, Oh, my! His face was turned, but Cake saw his whole body shake. Telephone Meyer, exclaimed Noyes suddenly. Meyer? Crumb became suddenly composed, and Cake saw that he was tremendously surprised. You don't mean that you're going to... After this? Why, she's in the know. Look at her. It's perfect. "'and they both turned and looked at Cake "'standing unconscious and serene "'on the other side of the room. "'You who have seen her know just how perfect the pose was. "'It is perfect,' Noyes said. "'I'd be a pretty poor sport if I did not acknowledge that.' "'Then his voice dropped, "'and Cake only caught snatches here and there. "'Such genius, once in a century.' "'Get even with him in a way he least expects. "'Wipe off the slate entirely. "'No come back to my play. "'Let him see that for himself. "'Call Meyer.' "'Then he turned to Cake. "'Sit down, please,' he said courteously. "'I have sent for a man who may give you an engagement.' She returned his gaze so quietly that he was puzzled. About her was neither nervous anticipation nor flighty vivacity. The actions of her audience of two left her incurious and calm. You see, she was used to the lodger. Also, she had worked to be famous so long that all the flowery borders of self were worn down to the keen edge of doing. Of plain cake she thought not at all, but then she never had, only of the light at the end of the passage that now loomed so bright to her watching eyes. It seemed only a minute before Noyes spoke again. This is Mr. Meyer. He regarded her shrewdly all the time. Cake bowed to Mr. Meyer, a fat, gaudy gentleman with thick, hairy hands, and Mr. Meyer looked at Noyes and shook his head. She realized they had already been talking together. Never before, Mr. Meyer said. If you will repeat that potion scene, Arthur Noyes suggested, this time I trust you will not be interrupted, he added politely and Cake stepped once more into that rich orgy of emotion. 
This time, though dimly aware of noise and a confusion of shouting, she carried the scene through to the end. "'Romeo, I come! This I do drink to thee!' She lay for a moment where she had fallen close to the heavenly colors of the rug. "'Good God!' gasped Mr. Meyer, and Cake sat up. She saw he was rather collapsed upon a chair near which he had been standing up when she began. His fat face was purple, and tears stood in his eyes. But Arthur Noyes had not changed— White, with that look of mortal hurt, he still stood straight and slim against the table. "'You cannot offer her less than two hundred a week to begin,' he said, with the same air of being alone with Mr. Meyer. "'No, oh, no, 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 no,' sighed Mr. Meyer, wiping his eyes. He rose and bowed to Cake with the queerest respect, still wiping his eyes with the back of his thick, hairy hands. It was a striking commentary upon her years of training that both of these men, successful from long and hard experience, paid her the compliment of thinking her an old hand at the game. "'Mine is the Imperial Theatre, Miss,' said Meyer. "'You should be there to-night by seven o'clock. "'It ain't necessary we should rehearse. "'No, oh, no, 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 no. "'And now, perhaps,' he looked her up and down, oddly, "'perhaps I can take you to your hotel?' "'Cake looked him back, serene in her belief in what the lodger had taught her. "'I'll be there at seven, she said. "'No, thank you.' She walked out and across into a small park where she sat until the appointed time. Then she went to the stage entrance of the Imperial Theatre, presented the card Mr. Meyer had given her, and entered. Once inside, she was taken to a dressing room by a fat, comfortable, middle-aged woman who seemed to be waiting for her. After a very short and, to cake, tranquil period, Mr. Meyer bustled in. "'Of course, miss, you know this is a review,' he explained, rubbing his hands with a deference that Cake shed utterly because she did not know it was there. She nodded, accepting this statement. "'We make em laugh here,' said Mr. Meyer. Again Cake nodded. She knew exactly as much about the show as she did before. "'You close the second act. It's the best place for you. Leafy here will help you dress.' Cake sat still while Leafy dressed her, very hushed and still. The light blazed so near after all these hard, lean years of pursuit, years in which the little affairs of life, like the business of growing from a child to a woman, had simply passed her by. Of that urge to be famous she was even more burningly aware. Herself she did not know at all. Mr. Meyer came and took her by the hand. His fat face was pale and sweating. He seemed almost awestruck by Cake's calm. He drew her out of the dressing-room and through a crowd of people, men and women with painted faces, some beautifully, some extravagantly and strangely dressed. They all stared. One woman shook her head. A man said, "'Search me, I never saw her before.' Then Mr. Meyer thrust her out in the face of a bright light. Begin, he said hoarsely. Walk over there and begin. Quietly, Cake obeyed. She had walked right into the bright light that had drawn her so hard and so long. Of course it was time for her to begin. And with this bright light in her face, which soon became to her the candle in that dark room left so far behind, she fared away to the magic land of beautiful make-believe. And only when Juliet, that precocious child, sank down poisoned, did she become aware of the uproar about her. The shouts of the lodger, Stop! My God! Stop! How do you get that way? augmented a million times. It was this she heard. Slowly Cake lifted herself on her hands,
Dazedly she peered through the heart of the great light that had caused her such suffering and that she had followed faithfully so bitterly long. On the other side she saw faces, rows and rows of them mounting up to the very roof, faces laughing, faces convulsed, streaming with tears, faces with eyes fixed and wearing that same queer, strained look she had noticed before, hundreds of faces topping each other in semicircular rows, all different but all alike, in that they were all laughing. She rose to her knees and rested there on all fours, staring. Laughter! A great clapping of hands rolled about her like thunder, dying down and rising again to even greater volume. Cries of, Go on! assailed her ears, mingled with, Stop! Stop! I can't bear it! The curtain fell before her, blotting out the vision of those faces, making the uproar slightly dimmer. Mr. Meyer advanced and lifted her to her feet. He moved weakly, exhausted with mirth. "'Even noise!' he gasped. "'He, he can't help it. "'Oh, my good God!' Cake looked away from him to the men and women that thronged about her, the same faces that had turned to her such a short while ago, but now how different! "'Oh, don't criticize,' one woman cried. "'Hand it to her. She can't be beat. "'She's the one that comes once in a century "'to show the rest of us what really can be done.' "'Meyer,' shouted a man, "'Meyer shall have to go back. "'Meyer, she stopped the show.' "'Quiet and very still, Cake drew away. "'It seemed to her only a moment later "'that Leafy touched her arm.' "'Mr. Meyer has taken a suite for you here in this hotel,' she added. "'Can't you eat a little, miss?' Eat? She had never had enough to eat in her life. Her life? She had spent her life securing food for the lodger that he might teach her to be famous. Leafy lifted the spoon of hot soup to her lips, and immediately she drank, she who had never had enough to eat in her life. Morsel by morsel, from the bountifully filled table, the kindly dresser fed her. Obediently she ate, and the hot, rich food stimulated her to swifter, more agonizing thought. Then, for the first time, she saw Arthur Noyes standing with his back against a closed door. She read pity in his eyes, comprehension, great wonder, and what she did not know then was the love that came to a rare perfection between them and has never faded, and has no place in this story. "'Will you tell me,' he said, "'what your name is, where your home is, and who are those that love you there?' Then he broke off and shrank a little against the door. "'Oh, don't,' he protested. Yet she had only looked at him and smiled, but it came to her keenly in her new awareness that his questions covered the whole of a woman's life, her name, her home, and the ones that loved her there. While she, she had no name, she did not even know the lodger's name. She looked down with strange astonishment at her grown-up figure, her woman's hands. She saw herself a ragged, gaunt, bushy-headed child, moving on a tightrope above a dark abyss, intent only upon a luminous globe floating just out of reach ahead of her, that she stretched out for eagerly with both her hands. Suddenly the lovely bubble burst, and the child was a woman, falling and falling among the rows of convulsed, shining white faces to the sound of gargantuan laughter. "'You tell me,' Arthur Noyes pleaded gently. And she did so very simply and beautifully. She did know Shakespeare. It was the only English that she had ever been taught. So Noyes heard how she became an instrument in the hands of the man who hated him mortally, and owed her debut 
and her terrible awakening to what he considered the only sporting answer to that insult. While he listened, he pondered, awestruck, upon the fact that out of all this muck and blackness, the degradation of hate by the lodger, the refinement of hate by himself, had flowered that rarest of all human creatures, one that could make the whole world laugh. He always hated me, he said. I told him he had traded his genius for drink, and he never forgave me. Where is he now? Now? Cake looked up at him in startled wonder. It came over her suddenly that he counted upon the lodgers being in the Imperial Theatre that night. Now, she repeated, why, he is dead. It took Noyes a minute to recover. What will you do, he asked her. Will you go on from this start, continue this, this sort of success? He felt it the basest cruelty in the face of her story to say that it was the only kind she was ever destined to make. He waited for her answer, wondering and a little awestruck. It seemed to him they had come to the supreme test of her genius. And she looked up at him with such sadness and such mirth, such tragic, humorous appreciation of the darkness in which she had been born, the toilsome way she had traveled to the great light and what it actually revealed when she arrived. I will go on from this success, she said. Involuntarily she raised her hand to her breast. I must, since it is the only way for me. You see, with a humor far more touching than the saddest tears, I must be famous. And she smiled that smile that hurt him, the smile the world loves and will give anything to see. The most famous fun-maker of her time looked away from the bright river fleeting beyond the trees to her giggling, half-terrified visitors. Fame, she said, is a secret that cannot be told. It must be discovered by the seeker. Let me offer you tea as a substitute. End of The Urge 